In French, le conte means the story, or the tale. In geological terms, le conte refers to one of the most spectacular mountains in the Appalachians. A 6,593-foot ridge that towers above its piers and stands alone in the Great Smoky Mountain sky. I was inspired by the mountain's beautiful namesake, and in honor of its majestic peaks, I decided to tell a story of Mount Lacan. Lacan offers the best westward-looking vantage point for the next 1,500 miles, and we found it fitting to capture the sunset from atop its cliffs. But to understand the beauty of Mount Lacan, you have to witness it at day and at night. To understand the spirit of this massif, to be in complete awe of the terrain, you have to eat and sleep on its meadows and atop its rocks. I was in search of visual thrill, wanting to stand atop the summit and feel glee and freedom. But the natural world puts on one of its grandest displays here, and the cliff tops put me in a melancholy. One that comes after witnessing supreme beauty and questioning if it'll ever be matched. Great wilderness adventures begin in the front country, in the valleys where the peaks come to rest and where the comfort of nearby water and calm air muffle the outside world. In the Great Smoky Mountains, the Smokemont Front Country site is my personal favorite. I find myself coming back time and time again. I've always appreciated the proximity of scenery and comfort that you can find here. We set up camp under the stars, with Orion and the God of War visibly protecting us in our sleep. Dawn in the Smoky seems to be its most consistent feature. The clouds rest in the valleys and the gorges at night, and at the first sight of sun sprint up the hillsides and into the sky. Today, we woke with the sun. Clouds, for which the park is named, had left us. That morning, we caught up with Jordan's friend, Allison. After some surprisingly delicate trail coffee, we set out for the Alum Cave Trailhead. Good. Yeah, well, I didn't sleep well. I normally wake up like 10 times during the night, and I just didn't. <laughs> My last sleeping bag that I had is a zero degree bag, so it's supposed to be really warm. Mm -hmm. Is it that night? Yeah. And I've just got a new one. Um, so I graduated a semester before she did. Yeah, but she start. So she just graduated early. I took four. <laughs> that is some good looking coffee.
In order to do justice to the mountain, to pair with LeConte the visuals that would properly speak to its beauty, I decided to hike up almost all of my camera gear, a 17-pound package in total. It's a really smooth trail so far. Probably because it's trafficked a lot. It's like a perfect 70 degrees, a little windy. The sunlight is gorgeous. I look a little ridiculous right now. All this gear. This hike is relatively easy. The only thing making it hard is the amount of shit I'm carrying. I don't even know if I'll need these lenses on top of a cunt, but... The trail's first mile winds along the banks of Alum Cave Creek. The creek creates shallow pools of water bookended by tumbling cascades. Thankfully, the grade was gentle, the trail was wide, and the breeze offered a cool headwind. We arrived at Arch Rock just before 10 a.m., the first major landmark in our ascent to Lacan. Upon entering the arch, the trail transforms into a more volatile version of its former self. The remaining four miles to the summit grow increasingly rockier and more imperfect, and at this time of year, wet. It's late February now and the water's coming off the mountain in full force. I'm going to admit here that I'm always far too optimistic on distance when hiking. We were only now nearing the Alum Cave Bluff, 2.2 miles into a five and a half mile ascent. Well, we've climbed about two and a half miles now. On any other day, I wouldn't be in such a hurry to climb a trail like this. But we had a sunset to capture, and before that, we needed time to set up our sleeping arrangements at the Lacan shelter near the summit.
Now that the water I'd collected from the low trail had been sufficiently coated in dirt, I more or less gave up on overprotecting my gear. After several curious looks from backpackers descending the ridge, I decided to continue climbing with my pack, camera bag, and tripod in hand. Normally I try and minimize the load on my back, but at almost 50 pounds, my gear was decidedly the opposite of ultralight. It's been a long time since I've climbed such an exposed and spectacularly carved section of trail. Not since Vernal Falls in Yosemite and the Linville Gorge chimneys have I felt such a vertically induced thrill. The beauty of the trail was keeping me sane. The solitude and the density of the forest was exhilarating in its own way. And in a grove along the trail, exactly halfway between the trailhead and the summit, the smoky mountain air breathed new life into our legs and put on a show overhead. We sat for lunch and didn't speak much. Now was a time for reverence. After I ate, I read the only thing easily accessible in my pack, a National Park Service guide to the flora and fauna in the area. Allison had thankfully grabbed a true map, a topographical from National Geographic. And then it looks like a little over another mile to get to the actual summit. We consulted it for a while, hoping to discern exactly where on the trail we were. Our watches were quickly rotating into the latter half of the day, and the sunset was only moving closer. After we agreed upon which sub-peak was our sunset spot, we packed up and set out again. The ridges that tumble downward from Leconte's major summit are rugged and aged. Weary stacks of earth crumbling back down toward the rest of it, having aspired to great heights in their prime. These knobs were once great pinnacles, far taller than they are today, towering high above the volcanic violence and the glacial movement that formed them. These tired mountains are the remnants of an ancient and skyward wall of stone. The mountains here are truly ancient, too. They were rising high above the earth before flowering plants and the dinosaurs, stretching upward before land animals were a thought in the mind of God, and before multicellular beasts were concocted in the sea. Still today, these mountains stand proud. Lacan itself rises 5,300 feet from its base elevation of 1,200 in Gatlinburg. The climate here represents that of the southern Canadian highlands. A temperature above 85 degrees has never been recorded on Lacan, and most of the year sees nights below freezing. But like the humans that walk it, the mountain grows quieter with age. By now, the afternoon sun was high, but sinking lower. With little time to spare, we continued on the rock walls and gravel paths that spiral up the slopes. So steep. I think at the time of recording, that was intended to be sarcasm. In retrospect, I'm not sure.
The final mile of the trail is effectively a stroll. The spruce fir forest here since the last ice age are cool and superbly quiet. The isolation on top of Lacan, especially during the low season, is unparalleled. The cliff tops, a sub peak of Lacan, offer the best westward view in the park, and likely the best sunset spot in any part of the country east of the Rocky Mountains. As the light fades, the clouds start to run away with the wind, swept up by the ridges below us. There was a storm predicted for tonight, a section of rain and heavy wind headed our way, but there was no evidence of that standing on these cliffs. but the forecast was spot on. The distant storm loomed and blocked the sun as it was still far above the horizon, casting out waves of gold and sending the billowing clouds into a fury. We awaited the final moments of light with our bunkmates in the shelter and protected ourselves as the wind picked up speed. The landscape settled into a deep blue glow with a fire burning high in the sky. I'd resolved to tell a story of Mount Lacan a mountain left permanent in my memory from a distant childhood adventure and my newfound friends atop the ridge. I promised that I would tell the tale of such a storied and memorable summit, that I would gaze at the stars above it and capture its essence. To tell the world the message offered by these slopes and ridges. To portray Lecomte beautifully and with precision. The exhilaration on the horizon and the beauty of my surroundings was too great. It occurred to me that I was experiencing uncontested magnificence, one of the most beautiful moments in my short time here on Earth, and that the excitement in standing here might never be mirrored. A great melancholy fell on me as I realized the dualism I was witnessing. A display too dazzling to put into words, to capture in any format. Lacant showed me that the majesty of experience is that it can't be replicated. In order to be properly told the story of Lacant and to retain its teachings for the rest of your life, you have to see it for yourself. But even that's not enough. You need to stay the night.